Hello, people. Today I have with me a woman known for her work as uh, Sasuke Kiryuin on Kill la Kill, uh, Mami Tomoe in Madoka Magica, Mitsuki in Kappa Maiki, Mrs. Carrie Karanen. Hello, hello, hello! And how are you doing today? I'm fantastic. So, Beautiful day in Los Angeles. We're getting a little bit of a heat wave here, so it's sweaty. And I've got a buddy of mine from high school who happens to be in town with his girlfriend, who I'm going to see later today, that I haven't seen in years. So mm. what is there to complain about? We're here on the 905. Uh, Frank just melted on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite that hot yet. I mean, we had a huge heat wave. We had like a big heat wave. It was like 90s recently. But today, but it's not too bad. It's like in the 80s and stuff. So it's nice. It's nice. It's nice. The, the average weather of Los Angeles. So. You know, it's been a little bit chilly. There's such a thing. Like everyone's always like, oh, LA, the weather's so beautiful. And it's like, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. I grew up in Michigan and then lived in New York for a long time. So of course, I'm not going to argue that there's quote unquote bad weather in LA. But also, it's not the tropics. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it gets cold here at night. It gets cold in the winter. We get heat waves. It's not like this temperate sort of like beautiful thing. And so don't let your friends lie to you. And then you show up in LA and as soon as it turns four o'clock, you're freezing because you didn't bring a sweater or a jacket because nobody told you that there's a 30 degree difference that happens from the morning to the afternoon to the evening in LA. So that's my public service announcement. If you come to LA, bring a sweater, even though you don't think you'll need it. It's like, hey, you want to come down to LA? Sure. Two days later, you didn't tell me it'd be this cold. Seriously, I used to get mad at friends when I didn't know that. And I warn my friends before they come here. I'll be like, listen, make sure at night it gets chilly. So my friend was just here and he was like, I should have brought that leather jacket. I should have brought that leather jacket because when he was here, it was like, it started to get like as cold as it gets here, which is like high 50s, mid 50s, low 50s. And he was like, it's, it's kind of chilly. I'm like, yep, yep, that happens. It happens. <laughs> you can't believe anything Angelinos say. We're all smoke and mirrors. Trust, dun, me, dun, I, dun. trust me, I live in Illinois where it gets freezing here. Oh, yeah, whereabouts? Uh, Central Illinois. Oh, because my family relocated to Louisville, Kentucky uh, about several years ago and so my sister went to she was in like indianapolis or something is that illinois uh no, no? that's indiana, that's indiana. Yeah. oh i got the wrong state huh yeah yeah, yeah all right to, you're welcome right. <laughs> you're welcome hey. so basically is this started you're, uh, like, oh. you're like has the interview has not even started yet nope, not yet and i'm already like totally off the rails okay yes focus <laughs> question okay. number one let's do this all right, so uh, what is it that got you interested in acting? Oh, my gosh. I don't even know that it was conscious. I, I've been doing it forever. I mean, I remember as far back as kindergarten doing, like, like Little Red Riding Hood, you know, and I just I – li I loved, like, playing characters. I'm a very, like, physical person. I always played sports, and I, what I loved about – theaters where I started, of course. I love the idea of like getting into a character and like running around and doing stuff and, and then the community that you get to like play. It's this like very organized, heightened like play between you and your friends. And um, I just, I just loved it. And I, I was, you know, terrible at it for a really long time. And then all of a sudden, you know, I started talking to people who were, had been doing it longer and were older and I'm like hearing them and hearing their perspectives. And then something kind of like started to click in and it was probably, you know, my eighth grade year that um, I really started to sort of realize what, like what the potentiality was there and, and, and how that could be a part of my life. Um, and it was that year that my sister was like in her high school musical, Brigadoon, right? And I don't remember anything about Brigadoon, um, the, sh the show itself, but I do remember I have this like very strong memory of sitting in the audience watching this unfold in front of me and just feeling electrified. And I remember in that moment thinking, I want to spend my life making people feel the way I feel right now. Mm. You know, and you make that kind of vow as a child, you know, like you don't really know what it means. And the next thing you know, you're like, you're off on this career and it's so crazy and up and down. You're like, oh, why couldn't I have felt that way about accounting? <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just, but I feel less and less that the, my life is a series of choices I made and more and more like my life is a series of choices that became revealed to me that I had to ultimately just follow, you know, like I feel less and less like, oh yeah, I made that choice and I made that happen. And I was like, oh, I became aware of it. And I was like, oh yes, of course, that's the, that's it. That's the answer. That's the direction. That's the place to go. That's the thing to do now. 
and you just and then you just take action. And so it's really been more that kind of experience than oh, I've decided. Hmm. And uh, where where did the uh, whole like you becoming a voice actor thing? Where did that like start? Oh, I was doing a stage play actually at the time with Moliere. I was doing these two one acts. That was super fun. And our director came in one day and said, "Hey, there's this guy auditioning for like Japanese cartoons or something, and he's looking for new talent and blah blah blah." And I was like, "I'll I'll go audition for that, sure." And um, I called him up, and it was Michael Center Nicholas, and he had NYAV Post at the time, and the project was Berserk. And um, I just went in, you know, and he was telling me about it, about the project, you know, about the story, like what the, what the anime is about. And I was just like, you know, coming from just American cartoons, I was like, oh, my God, they make cartoons like this? <laughs> what? Like, I was just totally blown away, you know, so you with the complexity. Of, like, you weren't really aware of anime? You know, I... Once I started doing it, I then, I then became like my first experience with anime. Now that I understand it, was actually like watching Cowboy Bebop like late night on a cable show, like when I was in high school or something. Hmm. But when I saw it, I didn't know what it was. Like I didn't know there was a whole. It was part of like this whole thing com called anime that's like out of Japan. Like I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was. I just knew that it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. So it wasn't until years later that I started to understand this whole community that it existed, you know? And I was like, oh. unlike some people, I feel like I talked to a bunch of fans, you know, one of my favorite questions to ask them is like how they got involved in like watching anime. And most of the time it's like, oh, my friend showed me such and such. Or my friend said, you have to watch such and such. But like, I didn't know that. I just was sitting down by myself in a room watching, flipping through cable and being like, what is this thing? So I, you know, I was totally lost for several years, and then I started audit, and then I started audition. I started to like work in it, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is that thing!" And I brought up the show to someone else, and of course, like everybody knows the show, and I thought I was the only person who like knew this show because no one, none of my friends knew it, you know. So, um, so yeah, I wasn't really aware of it as, as like a, a culture. I just knew that I had seen some things that I now understand to be a part of it, you know. In retrospect, looking back, um. But yeah, so I was like, so when, but I was in there and I was auditioning, I was like, I can't believe that a cartoon could be this complex and this whatever. And he, uh, he didn't have a, he had just moved studios because of 9-11 and, um, mm. and uh, he didn't really have the, the script and stuff. And there was literally one line, you're a mad dog. Like that was it. That was mm. my entire audition. And, you know, like new talent, they don't know me. They have one line of audition. So he calls me up like a week later and says, hey, listen, they like you. They can't tell. It's one line. That's my, like, you know, it's our fault. But, you know, how about this? How about you come in and you record for two hours? And if they like you and we keep it, I'll pay you for it. And if not, it's the longest callback you've ever had in your life. And I was like, sure, yeah, that sounds great because I thought at least I would have the opportunity to like work on a dub and figure out how that whole thing – because there's a, there's a technical skill to it, you know, the, the beeps and the memorizing and the making it match but also acting and the – you know, your brain kind of goes like gong, 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 you know, if it's kind of uh, – if it can get fried, you know. So I thought this is great and I really liked him and I really liked the project and I was like, I'm going to win this project. I'm going to show up and I'm going to win this project, you know. So – and I did. I did. Um so that's really how I started was doing that show and getting the referral to the audition. And I, I was lucky enough. I was just flat out lucky enough to book my first audition. You know, so then once I was working on that and we would have to continue working. And once you know how to like dub, then you start to get introduced around because you can kind of technically like perform at that rate. And then it kind of just goes from there, you know, inside the community. And I'm assuming it was a, uh, it was like a like anime, like it wasn't done like by yourself in a in a in a small room. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That little booth. It's so interesting because I think the hardest thing to get used to at first, and even now I sometimes still struggle with it, is you go in and you do stuff, and then it's like silence. And you can sometimes look through, like, if it's just the director, then they're usually, like, talking to you or whatever. But if there's, like, a director and a producer, you know, like, doing, like, Kill I Kill, you know, Alex and, and um, Hiroe sitting, you're, like, looking out there and, and he's turned around and they're talking. You, you see them, like, passionately talking, you know, and you're, like, you don't know what's going on. So you have to, like, at first it's very alarming. You have to let your mind not 
start to go down the rabbit hole of like, oh my God, it was terrible. They hate me. They're going to fire me. What are they saying? I had sounded terrible. You know what I mean? Like you want to make sure not to go down that rabbit hole (laughs) because it's alarming. But, um, but, uh, I don't remember the question you asked. (laughs) I gotta be honest. I'm at the end of the story. I don't know how to wrap it up because I don't remember the question. Sorry about that. I think you wrapped it all up. It was basically (laughs) how you wanted to be a voice actor. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) Yes. Okay, well, you're welcome. This podcast runs like an hour 20, right? That's how long? (laughs) It it goes as long as it needs to. (laughs) (laughs) All right, all right. Okay, so next question. Yes. All right. um, Like, what are some of your favorite roles that you've done either like on stage, on screen, or uh, voice acting wise? Oh my gosh, favorite. Well, Satsuki is, you know, it's funny. People say favorite and I always think, hmm, I don't know how to say favorite. I don't know how to say favorite because I feel like that to me is very uh, contextual. Like, what's my favorite thing to eat? Well, it depends on what mood I'm in. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's cereal. Sometimes it's ice cream. What um, role do you like a lot? <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. And I and I and I feel like whenever I hear that, I always think about like the ones that are the most meaningful to me, and and meaningful in that they either really made a big difference in my career in terms of like me having to grow as an actor or really meant a lot to me in terms of the experience I had with the, 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 the people I was working with or the kind of the time in my life that they, that they happened. Cause whenever I hear things work, I've done, I always, it's amazing. I hear it and I can immediately remember like the details of my life, the day I recorded it, you know, and like what was happening and where I was living and where I was working and who I was dating and all this. It's like, it's really weird. It's like these little memory capsules. Um, and so I think that the roles that really stand out for me are the ones where all those three things kind of coalesce and they, they sort of, it's all those things. It's a role that was challenging at a time that meant a lot to me and with a group of people that meant a lot to me. And I would say that those roles for voiceover are definitely berserk just because it was my first one. And as I met Michael, I later worked for his company. You know, I met like Mark Drazon, you know, who to this day I still call guts. Like, and it's it just like, it was, that was a really powerful and important role. Cause I also like l- was learning what to do and to be able to revisit it recently with the trilogy and just see how everyone's grown and how much our lives have changed and evolved was just kind of just so incredible. Um, I, uh, Satsuki was super important to me because she was very, very challenging. Um, so I grew a lot doing that role. That role was like super impactful in terms of the fan base. And, um, and I've really, really enjoyed, um, being able to connect more with, with the fans, you know, through like Twitter and social media, um, that are like the, and, and I think that that particular role has really, has really, um, shown a big increase in that dialogue with fans, which I really appreciate. Um, and also just like the time in my life that I was recording her was such an important time in my life in terms of the things that changed and like grew and stuff. So she's super important to me. Um, mommy was super challenging, but like really unlocked a whole new set of roles. Like that mentor, that sweet, that round place that I hadn't really done that many of them prior to her. But ever since I kind of unlocked that with her, I've booked a lot more of those kinds of characters. And it's really nice to have found this like centered, more gentle part of me because I'm, I think that that's not something that's like very like forward in my personality normally, though it's, though it's something that's like in, in private, my close, close friends know that as an aspect of me, but most people don't. And so I think it was really wonderful get, to get a chance to share that kind of that sort of softness, that gentle, that loving place. Um, and then Mokuba was super important to me because it was my first boy. It was my first boy lead. And, it, you know, there's a lot of pressure to, like, st- and, you know, come in and, and step in for Tara. And, you know, she's so fantastic. And and working with Eric, who is just, like, he's known to be a, a tough director. Like, he knows what he wants. I mean, he's great about, like, communicating it to you. Mm-hmm. So you can deliver, but he knows what he wants and you got to, you got to come in and be ready to deliver, you know? And, and, um, and so that was really like, uh, that was very nerve wracking, but, um, but just, I learned so much working with him and man. And, um, but, uh, another role that I really love is, um, I'm actually doing this like stage version. It's called the lamprey. And if you're in LA, um, I'm I'll be doing the character. I have three shows coming up at second city. And then we're actually producing it into a web series that'll be out this fall. And she's just this like 
And I love her. She feels like a she feels like a anime character to me in this weird way that she's like totally she's like a cop, right? But I play her like she's this like uh, this like 1930s dirty noir cop stuck in a woman's <laughs> body, you know? And she's like disgusting. She's like totally disgusting in like her attitude and the way she behaves and moves and like oversexed, like way oversexed. But like, come, but like, looks really pu- cute and like pretty. And a friend of mine um, was like, "I don't know your work that well. Like, I've only really started seeing your stage work, and I feel like it's she's so sexy and yet disgusting at the same time." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, she's fun." Um, so, yes, so I've I been doing my, I've been doing her at this like late night show called Serial Killers at Sacred Fools, which is a theater company out here. Um, and they do great work. And this is their like late night series that's been going on for 10 years. It's kind of competition based. It's like, and we're in the middle of the championships and we just got voted out. Um, we actually came in second for the night, but we had time penalties. So we ended up getting voted out. So, um, oh. but it's okay. She lives. She'll, she'll live to see another day. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just, but I also really like about that character is not only is she touched, like I so enjoy playing her, but you can just, when you, when you do something that really impacts others. Because I can just stay in my bedroom and, like, talk to myself and, you know, which I do. And who cares, right? Like, who cares? But when you get to do something, like, put your heart into it and then, like, send it out into the world and then it affects other people and touches their lives. Like, that's when it matters. Like, that's the purpose of art. So anytime you get to play that, you know, a character that does that and gets that response, you know, it's, it's so gratifying. And then, and then I have a web series that I made that's allegedly autobiographical called mm-hmm. Reasons I Don't Like Myself and Other Stories of Erratic Behavior. <laughs> um, and they're just like little snippets of, you know, little slice of life moments and stuff. So I, of course, really loved that because that's something that I've also created. But I'm creating, but I did it because I was like, oh, here are some things that, you know, like we all feel like we, I hope, I hope that we all feel this way. I don't know, I feel this way. You know, there's things about us that we think like, oh, my God, why am I such a spaz? Or am I the only one who does this? Or why am I so – I'm trying so hard to be normal. Why can't I come off as normal? Like, you know, and and like I, and I just have all these questions. And you start to feel like, is, does this only happen to me? Am I the only one that feels this way? Am I the only one that struggles with this? And so I just started making these things, you know, and, put, and then I started putting them on the world and being like, oh, am I the only one? And now – but it's been nice because people have responded back and been like, "Oh my God, I've had that same experience. I've had that." So it's been very, it's been very normalizing for me. So, so thank you all to anyone who is listening who has responded to my web series by saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, I felt that way about running," or "Oh yeah, yeah, I felt that way too." I'm like, "Yeah, oh thank you, thank you." You're the only one. <laughs> I know, right? Because we do. We can start to feel alone, you know? Like, oh my God, everyone else online, they've got it so together. They've got all these answers, you know? They got it figured out. And you're like, oh, how did they, how did, how did, how did you figure that out? I don't, I don't, have, I don't have anything figured out. What, where did you get all the answers? I don't have the answers. What do you know that I don't? I know, right? Yeah, you're like, oh God, oh God. <laughs> Wow, I know I went off the rails on that one. And <laughs> again, it's fine. <laughs> it was on on the on a side note. With when it come, when I when I introduce people, I always look up like the roles people like associate with this voice actor the most. Huh? And I had like there's a few things of yours that a lot of people were saying like were some of your best roles, like Mommy and huh? and uh, Kaska Mitsuki. And some of them, it's like, I don't even know how to pronounce the names. So I'm like, if I don't know the show, I'm kind of worried that I might say the name wrong. And I'll say, yeah, absolutely. Even when I go into the, um, even when I go into the, uh, the booth, you know, like they're like, oh, this is how you say it. And then you're like, okay. And then you do your best. And then there's times when just the inflection, the normal, like American inflection of just how we say sentences will suddenly like make you make the pronunciation of the Japanese name a little bit off. And then you sort of like, wait, how do I say this sentence with that intention, but not affect the pronunciation of the word. And just like a, it's a, you can sometimes get stuck. So uh, I with, totally understand. With Madoka. I actually, um, I actually started watching that today because I hadn't oh. watched it before. I, I saw that i saw him behind the voice actors before. I thought it was Mammy or Mamai <laughs> or something. Like, yeah. And I saw it was, and I watched it and they said, mommy, I was like, but it looks like mammy. Like, it does. It does. It does. Like, mommy just sounds 
it's it sounds like mommy. <laughs> Like it's, I know the only the like the only trick the trick that I find helpful is that just to know that in the Japanese language they only have the five pure vowels a i u e o so uh, everything so all our diphthongs are like out the window yeah. and so that's that's the thing like in auditions and stuff where like if I'm not really sure I just I'm like well I know they're the pure vowels so I'm just gonna do my best. <laughs> And then you, like you say it like the most like you butcher it the worst it's like ah uh, it's actually written like this. <laughs> Yeah, but there. I mean, for an in an audition set setting, they don't really necessarily penalize you too much for something like that, um, you know, because they know that they can be like, okay, well, this is actually the pronunciation when you get when you get into the room, you know. So, yeah. but yeah, it's uh, it's tricky. And let me tell you, people do even even for me, like people get they get mad if you say it wrong. You're like, okay, okay, I, I get it, I get it, I get I'm it. Sorry. I slipped up, I slipped up, everybody, everybody. Okay, relax. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. Nobody died. Nobody died. <laughs> I mean, except for, you know, mommy does die. So, oops, sorry. Oh. oh. Sorry. That was totally a dick move. You just told me you just started watching it. I apologize. I I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. I'm going to have to I'm gonna put a, like a big annotation right before this part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, she it's pretty early on in the series. So if you watched... If you watch it, you know, most people know. Right. Well, that I was actually going to go into is like, do you watch the stuff that you're in? Um, I, I try to. I try to. It depends on, you know, like the the availability. Uh, um, like right now, I actually, because I got a new MacBook um, and they don't have discs, disc drives in them anymore. So I can't watch anything on disc. I have to go to like a friend's house. So I sometimes arrange like watching parties. Um, I went to my friend's house to watch... Uh, um, it's one of the Marcas and, uh, and then we actually had once the, um, the final movie Rebellion came out I actually organized uh, like a, 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 group, a group watching with um, all the girls from the episode for all the magical uh, girls like the cast got together with the director and we watched the movie together so uh, that was really fun. <laughs> yeah and then Christine uh, Christine Marie Cabanos uh, she and I started doing like a watch down of like Toradora um, we only got halfway through and we have to finish it because now I'm like, what happened? I left there. They're at the beach house still. <laughs> um, so I'm like, I'm like, I, what, what happens? So, um, so, so it's a, it's a bit more challenging for me these days to watch things. But now that there's more stuff that's on Netflix, once it finally is like done releasing and then they put the English version on there so that I'm hope, I'm hopeful for that. <laughs> right, and I was, um, I was curious cause we've brought up Kill a Kill and it's funny cause the, it's actually really good timing on this because the final episodes came out recently. Yes, 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 yes. And they're doing apparently a marathon. Toonami is doing a, a marathon on the on Memorial Day weekend of all the episodes that have aired thus far on Cartoon Network, Toonami. So to kind of like catch people up and stuff. So it's like a big, it's a big time. It's a big time for Kill I Kill. We just made our own advertisement for Toonami. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm like, yeah, heck yeah. I'm like, everyone should see it. I was like, was that was that show really hard? Because again, they're screaming like constantly yeah. in that show. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I was I got sick at one point and I had to leave. There was one session that I had to leave because I I I had like a sinus thing happening and we had done enough screen we had done enough screaming and talking that I had to cut it. But um, but they're very sensitive to that. Like they know what I'm gonna what you're gonna be recording. So you know they as we got further along and there's more like battle scenes or if they knew that you know a battle scene was a big part of it, they would do to the, like they would skip, schedule me for shorter sessions. You know, so your voice wouldn't like rip out because by the end you kind of start to have a sense of how la long your voice can last in something. And then also the director will often like flag a scream. Like if it's a big scream or big yell, he'll flag it and move it to the end of the session. So we'll do everything else and we'll kind of come back to it so um, to not blow my voice out. So, yeah. you know, they, we, we all try to be sensitive about that to make sure that, you know, we don't lose any recording time. It's to everyone's benefit. Um, but yeah, she's, um, it's rough. And it's also rough because yeah, you can do things and like really, you can protect your voice like to a certain extent, but then there's certain moments, there's certain emotional moments. Like it's one thing to just do a battle cry, right? But right. then there's certain moments where the emotionality behind that is so vulnerable or, you know, has something, has some sort of quality in it that you can't like protect your voice and get it at the same time. There are just those moments. And so you got to just 
go for it, you know? And I remember, you know, certain ones like when I first put, put on June Cats, you know, like that yell. And then there's certain transformation yells. And, you know, there's some things that happen in the end of the series that I'm not going to talk about because it just came out that, you know, like you have to have a certain emotion there. And then, you know, it's either like go for performance or go for protection. And so you just flag it, do it at the end of the session and then drink tea and don't talk on the phone for the rest of the night, you know, <laughs> book it at the end of your day. Right, because I've heard um, those like those horror stories of like uh, the guys who work on Dragon Ball like passing out or like I remember Peter Cullen for, who played Optimus Prime had this like story where he was coughing up blood when he did the noises for the Predator. Yeah, I mean it can, it can, and you know it's it's also like there's also this balance like you know your your body is your your body's always changing right so something that you know maybe didn't affect you so much one day it might really tear you up another day and. And like, how much did you eat? And are you hot? Are you well hydrated? There's like all these things uh, that you have to do. And so I think the biggest thing is to really try and like practice as much self care for your physical, your whole body all the time, as much as you can, you know? And that means like, just to just be healthy for your whole body, because that's the platform for your voice to be healthy. And then it's like, you know, drink a lot of water. So you're like, well hydrated and stuff. But yeah, there's, there's times where just what's required is is just going to take it out of you, man. And, um, and you just, you, you just, you just like get through it. And, and, and as long as you're not really damaging yourself, like long term, you know, cause that's, that's not good, but there's all there's, we've, you know, we've all had moments where the more yelling or the stuff or like the more breath you're using in that tiny little booth, you know, you can start, you, of course you can start to get dizzy or pass out, but also, you know how regular it is or how, you know, understandable it is because, like, I had the director be like, sit down, sit down, sit down, you know what I mean? So, and then be like, it's okay, let's okay, no problem, let's take 10 minutes, let's take it, you know, so they're all, like, mostly they're very sensitive to it and they understand, you know, they understand, like, what you're doing and what it takes, so. Right. It's like, I, what do you I get, like, you know? I've always, like, been horrified. I remember there was a an interesting bonus feature on uh, the Powerpuff Girls movie. There's a guy, the guy who played Mojo Jojo, there's a scene where he's recording this whole scene and he passes out at one point. Yeah, because if you're just, like, going, 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 you know, and also I think the challenge is that you're not actually regulating your body. You're having to pace out, especially in dubs, you're having to pace out with what they're doing, what's, like, on there. And, you know, you don't necessarily know that the original actor did all of that in the same, like it could be edited together, right? So if it's edited together and they've taken out gaps, then places where the original actor had a chance to breathe, you don't have the space to breathe or, you know what I mean? Or, but just the way it's coming out of you and your breathing patterns are just going to be different than another human being's breathing patterns. So you are like, so it's not just me trying to manage myself through like a, a two minute tirade, which I can do on stage without passing out. It's me pacing to some other human being's breathing, speaking, and then also the way that they animate it might not be exactly exactly to the performance, you know what I mean? But, you know, you're trying to match it. Because, you know, sometimes it's it's like they don't do every single flap necessarily or something. So then it has to be get rewritten. And so there's a lot of elements to it that can that can that can really call for more from you than than normal, then you don't control. Cause I don't think, I don't hear as many stories of people like passing out in like prelay reads when like they get to control their own like pacing and breath. Right. You know? Yeah. I don't really hear those. It's mostly like mid, like usually like during the recording I've heard stories. Like yeah. That. Like, yeah. Which one that tells me, well, for Peter Cullen, I can understand cause the predator is constantly roaring and growling and stuff. Yeah. So oh my God. That. Yeah. Right. But. I'm so I'm such a fan of people who and I, I you know I want to do I, I've all, I always want to do creature voices but I just don't get I don't get a lot of auditions for that stuff so I've booked several of them when I do get the auditions but I just I'm so fat like the people who can do that with their voice and sustain it and be consistent it's just like I think it's such a it's just an amazing skill I'm so I'm just so impressed I'm so impressed it's like I've always wondered because I know like how does the recording process for that like how do you audition for a creature like I've always wondered that you know usually they have like they just put in parentheses like kind of the the, the context or the emotional tone right they'll be like mm. scared they'll be like scared or um you know uh like low level intimidation or um attack or dying or 
um, death blow. You know, they, they just give you like a context or an emotional quality and then you, and you know, like they'll give you, you know, you usually have a visual of it. They'll, you'll, they'll, you'll get a picture of what it looks like. So you can kind of sort of think what sound you think comes out of that thing. And, um, and then like, uh, usually like some sort of backstory or some sort of like the concept of it, like, you know, some creatures are just straight up evil, like predators, you know, there's a difference between playing like a Tronosaurus Rex and playing a bron- uh, like a Stegosaurus or, you know, like if you're playing different dinosaurs, like there's, you know, they're different. They have different qualities. They have different, you know, um, diets or whatever purposes. So you, they kind of, you get like the background, like whatever their concept of that creature is. Um, and then, yeah. And just like the context. And then you kind of make up what whatever you think is what that sounds like and feels like. Right, because I I've been uh I I've actually looked into that. Like I've attempted creatures before, but I usually like it's kind of like a whole like it's a I've learned how to do it by Frank Welker, like how he does the snarl for a lot of creatures, mm. like the whole <laughs> I've learned how to do that. Yeah, you got to learn to play your whole sinus cavity, I think. I mean, D. Bradley Baker is, I mean, I think he's really just someone who's like super renowned for his, his ability and, and his technique. And he has, a, he has a blog that he started, I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but I've seen some posts from it. Um, and he has a really, you know, he has his own like unique way to sort of explore that. But I mean, that's the thing that these, like the, 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 the greats are always exploring you know, how, like what their instrument is and what it does. And when you put the sound and the focus in certain places, you know, what, what that means, what that creates, what that does, you know? And so there is something about it that you're like, you're always learning, you're always working, you're always like developing, you know? It's like D and Frank amaze me. Like D Breaker and Frank Walker, both of them. Yeah. I mean, they're like freaks of nature practically. I mean, what a, what a gift, what a gift to humanity (laughs) that like those dudes have figured out how to make that happen. (laughs) Yeah, like, <sighs> like, 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 D is, like, kind of, like, like, I've always saw, like, Frank is doing, like, the big creature guy. D is always, like, these, like, reptiles or bugs or aliens. Like, it's kind of amazing what he, what he does with his nose. Yeah, and he literally, does, like, plays his face, you know, like, he's just, he's a, he's an incredible, and anyone listening, if they're, you should definitely look, look him up. I'm sure his blog will come up, and he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's awesome. I think my favorite was when I saw I Know That Voice, he did this trick where he put, like, a vase to his face and, like, started, like, doing this growl to, like, make it... Yeah, yeah, you know, and you're just like, wow, wow. And that was just, like, I'm like, that was just him one day just, like, exploring and, like, figuring it out. Like, just, like, it was like, I'm gonna put this here and see what happens, you know? And you just go, like, that's amazing. That's amazing. I know, before I knew of him and, like, knew what he was doing, I would never have thought of that. Be like, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? Like, it's, he's just incredible. Super, super duper. Right, and, um, is, you were originally a New York voice actor. And now yeah. You're in, now you're in Los Angeles. And yeah. You, do you still do both? Because I've seen, like, some New York stuff still in, like, recently. Well, I took a trip to New York recently. And when I go, whenever I go into town, well, I did Pokemon recently in New York um, because I was like, hey, I'm coming into town. You got something? Because I've worked with him before. I've worked with the director and the producer before. And they were like, yeah, actually, yes. Um, and so I still have relationships with a lot of the companies that I worked with. So if I'm in town, then I for sure will, um, you know, reach out. If I'm going to be there long enough that I can actually do something, then I'll reach out. For sure, absolutely. Why not? And uh, what was the transition like when you like moved to California? You know, I got so lucky. Honestly, honestly, so 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 lucky. I, I know a lot of people when they first come to LA, it's 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 a big struggle, and some people their first year here is really hard. Um, but I, I I was lucky for a couple of reasons. Um, one, when I started thinking, even thinking about. LA might be in my future. I started planning for it, living in New York. Cause I thought, oh, the last thing I want to do is suddenly decide I want to move to LA and then like not be ready and have to wait six months and how, what misery that might cause me, you know? So as soon as I started thinking about it, I was like, okay, I only started looking at agencies that were bi coastal or like everything I was investing in was like only by, was like just with a bi coastal mind. And I had this huge, I took one of those like big like post it note you know, easel size post-it note, sticky right. things. And I put it on my wall and I just wrote everything out. I was like, okay, I want to have a recent national commercial and a recent primetime credit and, you know, like one more lead on a, sh- on a, on a voiceover and 
I want to have this much money saved and I want to make sure I'm debt free. And I want, like, I just put all this stuff and I was like, make sure I go to the dentist and get those shoes fixed. Like I just, everything that I just thought, you know, like, Oh, I don't want to go there and try and find a dentist, you know, anything. I just, I just brainstormed one day, like on these two pieces of paper. And I was like, okay, this is, and that was my like LA plan, you know? Um, but I tell you, I got up and I looked at that. I looked at that, those boards every day and over the next like five, six months, just things were flying off that list. They were just like, check, 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 you know? And it's just like those things that like, you don't really have control, you know? You just kind of have to really just, when you take your strong, strong desire and you put it towards like a vision, all you can do is just like keep focusing on your desire and then like allow the universe or whatever to just unfold you know, and, and, and put in the work and just keep going. And then you get surprised by how it all falls into place. And literally I was on the phone with my friend, an amazing voiceover actor, actress, and, 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 and author. Um, she does tons of campaigns, um, more on the commercial side than the animation side, but, um, uh, named Meredith Zeitlin and she's just incredible. And she and I were talking on the phone and then I was really frustrated about something. And she just said to me, she goes, you know, what, Carrie, I think it's time. I think it's time. You've been talking. I think it's time. I said, you know what? I think you're right. She goes, yeah, I'm right. I go, OK, I have to get off the phone. I have to book my ticket. I literally got off the phone and I was on a plane two weeks later. Mm. So so for, so really like having that planning. So I, I was poised to go as soon as I made the decision. I was like ready to go. Um, I also landed, I was, uh, it worked out that I was house sitting for a friend of mine. So I had a place to be for six months. So I didn't have to like worry about all that stuff. I had time to come into town, know I had a place to be, take care of that place, knew what my rent was going to be super reasonable and be able to figure out my life. And then by the time I moved out of that, I knew like, oh, these are the neighborhoods I'm going to. This is how much money I'm making. This is my budget. This is what it costs to live here. Like all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then also my agents were just awesome. My agents all were mostly East Coast based only. And so they gave me all these referrals to West Coast offices. And I, I met with a bunch of them. And again, again, I just got lucky. I was so lucky. I had just recently booked, um, you know, several, I had, ju- I had gotten all those things off the list, right? I had a national, I had two national campaigns under my belt coming out here. I had um, a new, uh, like a recent primetime uh, credit out here. I had like my animation stuff coming out out here. So I just, I had great meetings and I basically got offers from pretty much everyone I met. You know, I really felt like, okay, clearly this is the right thing, you know? So by the time I started to feel homesick, I'd already had so much, so much success and so much of, so much reassurance that like I made the right choice that I never thought, oh my God, I should move back. And so when things got rough, you know, six months, eight months, nine months in, you know, I felt like, no, no, I'm good. This is good. This is fine. So it was really, I mean, it was, it was very, compared to other people, it was a fairy tale for me, you know, coming out here. Right, and have you, and you've been meeting like a lot more of the people that have been working down there, correct? Yeah. You know, I, I knew more people in New York because I was also producing in New York. So I met a lot of people, people a lot faster. And then here um, I have, it's taken me longer to meet people, though I did know a lot of LA talent prior to moving out here, um, uh, just from working in New York and producing in New York. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, you just like, again, like your community just grows. You just meet more and more people and then you get to go into a studio, a new studio and you audition there. And I, I got lucky. I got lucky. I, I, when I, I, I've gone in and I've, I've booked things pretty fast. You know what I mean? Like it just so happened that a character in that project, one of the first two or three projects was right for me. And so I booked it as opposed to, you know, sometimes you can audition for a studio and for projects, you know, and you can be like, several months in and you're just, it's just not really a click. It's not really a match. It's just because of what's available and, and who you are and you know what you, it just doesn't quite click. And then sometimes it really does. And I've just gotten lucky that, you know, my bookings have really like front loaded, you know, and then when I go the three months, not, you know, booking with them, it's not like, Oh, this person's not sticking. I think if those were my first three months with them. It might be different, but because they're like, okay, well, we know, and we know her, and we know her work, and it's going to be fine. It's just a matter of time before she books again, you know? So I feel like I've gotten very lucky at being able to front load my successes <laughs> to kind of, like, help in the lean times, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The funnier die thing in your email. <laughs> yes. 
How did you get that? <laughs> the guy in it, his name is Brian Grow, and he's an incredibly talented writer, funny, funny dude. I love him to death. He's one of my besties. I met him at a writer's group that I went to called Tuesdays at 9 LA. There's one in New York as well. Um, and I loved him as a writer, and I went up to afterwards. I was like, you, I love you. When do we work together? And I finally, we had done that piece for um, uh, UCB. Late night, they have like a late night thing for UCB that we had, had done it at. And then, um, because he and I would just always collaborate on things. We were just always like making stuff and doing stuff. And then I finally called him up one day and I was like, listen, should I get off the pot? Like it's time to start with the plate. You need to shoot something. Because I felt that his work on the page, people were misinterpreting. Hmm. They weren't really understanding his tone. I observed it in a lot of the readings at that event. Um, that some people understood his tone and some people did not. And I said, Brian, you have to, if you're starting to send out your writing to things, because he was starting to like get meetings and stuff, I said, you have to have something to point to and say, this is my tone. This is what my work is about. And so we ended up deciding until he's like, all right, let's shoot that. And I put it together. I, I, I got the location. I put it together. Um, well, he and I put it together. Like we had, he had a director that he liked. So we put it together. We shot it. We did not like the director's cut. The director was totally off tone, was like making it, trying to make it like this argument scene. And so Brian, I was like, Brian, you got to take this back. So he cut it together. He ended up editing it. He was editing at his friend's place, Bodega Films. And everybody who walked by was like, oh my God, that's hilarious. What is it? So they just like, the music for that, the guy was like, I just love it. Can I write the music for it? It cost him nothing to get it scored. Like cost him nothing to get it color corrected. Like because people just loved it. And when people... People want to get on board for stuff, you know, especially something like that. It's small, it's short. Like, so it took the guy, like, composed it overnight, you know what I mean? Because it's like, what, three, two minutes long? But, um, and then, and then we, and then we posted it and it was just like, it fucking took off because it was like good and it was funny and it was not what you expected. If it was just me yelling at him, that would have been like, who would have cared, right? But because of his tone and his pacing and, and how he did it, it, it ended up being what it was, you know? So, but that's like a perfect example of, Brian and I just made it. We just did it because we're huge fans of each other and we work together and we wanted more opportunities. And we have a short film that we waited with another friend of mine, Julie, and now we're like a little trio and me and Julie make a bunch of stuff together all the time, you know, and I pull in people to direct my episodes of reasons I don't like myself, you know, that I want to work with, I want to collaborate with. And then you sort of work on something small and then you kind of see how you work together. And then, then you start to do bigger things. And like, that's all that was. That seriously was, that's what that was. So I didn't, I made that happen for my. I made that happen for myself. I didn't go to an audition for that. And I gotta say, uh, thank you so much for letting me interview you. Of course, my pleasure, my pleasure. Is there uh, any advice you can give to people that would be interested in like doing voice acting or any other type? You know, I would just say, like, uh, well, I have two different things. Like, uh, just experience. Like, listen, like you. You just have to start to learn who you are as a performer. You just have to start. So you just have to kind of do it. You have to do it. You have to just do it. So if you want to do, like, if you want to act, you have to find ways to act. Whether that's, like, taking an improv class, doing improv, like, doing, you know, like, one acts, deciding to put up a festival of one acts with your friends. Like, you know, whatever it is, like, you just need the hours on stage or on camera or on mic. You just you just need it. That there, You know, like, the best thing to do is, like, learning on the job, you know what I mean? So like booking the work is also, and that never ends. It never ends. You're always going to keep learning and growing always, but like, just start, you know what I mean? Just start wherever you're at with whatever you have and just know that you don't have to do it all by yourself. You know, there are definitely things you can do by yourself. Like for voiceover, pick up a book, put, get on, get on a microphone and just start reading aloud. Just get used to like, reading aloud, having your voice out in the world, listening back to it, because it's going to be weird at first, you know what I mean? Yeah. And just like just doing it, just doing it, just being on a mic. And it doesn't matter. Like do it on your own computer. Like who cares? It's not, it doesn't have to be professional. Like ju just start, just start doing it. Read children's books, do all the different characters, like whatever, like just put in the time. Um, if you want to do, like, if you want to do performances, like, you know, you don't have to do it by yourself. You know, find a friend. Find a friend who wants to do it too and, like, put it together. Make something happen. Like, shoot a video. Like, whatever it is, you know. You don't have to share everything with the world. I've shot a lot of things that I do not share with the world. You know what I mean? They were for me. I learned something. I don't need to put them out there, right? <laughs> but but you have to have that experience. I think it's so hard now with, with social media that everyone – 
like they're just as an artist and as a person, you just, you need time to grow. You need time to like fail and to just figure things out. And I think now with social media, like everyone's always like up your ass every, every five seconds, you know, with like, like this and that. And oh, I didn't like that video. I like this video. Da, 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 da. You know what I mean? That I think it can be hard when you have that much external input, criticisms, critiques, when you're still just trying to find your own ground, you know what I mean? So make sure you're doing stuff for yourself and that you, you don't have to like put everything out in the world and like you don't have to open up the door to criticism and, and everybody else's opinions right out of the gate, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like share it with a couple of friends, you know, do like a get together with some friends and just read scenes or just read a play or, you know, like there's, there's a, a million ways to just start like kind of like doing it and feeling comfortable and confident if they're, you know, you're from like stage one all the way up, you know what I mean? There's like a million ways to like, just, I think the most important thing is to just ask yourself, where am I at? Just like very specifically, like, where am I at? What have I booked? What have I done? What have I studied? What do I have? You know, what's my body of work currently? And it doesn't matter what the answers are. It doesn't matter like, oh, I think it should be more than this. Everybody thinks it should be more than this. But just like be honest. Where am I at? And then be like, okay, great. That's where I'm at. Now, what does just one step beyond now look like? And do that. Just do that. And then keep doing it. And then next thing you know, you're looking back on 15 years of work. All right, that's my little spiel for today. Okay, no more <laughs> browbeating, okay? Or don't listen to me because what do I know what I'm saying? 